Welcome to this free anaesthetic tutorial on the rapid sequence induction. This tutorial is aimed at trainees who have just begun their anaesthesia training. The RSI is a key tool in the anaesthetist's ability to secure safe endotracheal intubation in patients at risk of aspiration of gastric contents. The rapid sequence induction describes the administration of an anaesthetic agent followed by a rapid acting neuromuscular blocking agent which induces unconsciousness and motor paralysis as quickly as possible. To make the process easier, we have divided it into seven key components and these are the seven P's and I will explain each in turn. The first factor is preparation and preparation can be divided into environment, equipment and personnel. Preparation is the keystone of anaesthesia and generally the best anaesthetists are those who plan each case with precision. The environment, intubation is a high risk procedure and humans are fallible. We all perform better in a safe familiar environment. Generally, intubating in theatre is set up for the task. If we are in an unfamiliar environment such as the ward or the emergency department then it is even more important that we optimise our preparation as we are at risk of forgetting key things due to the stress of this unfamiliar environment. Equipment the Association of Anaesthetists provide clear guidance about minimum monitoring standards and every patient undergoing any form of anaesthesia should be monitored to this standard. Do we have IV access that we can trust? Do we have scopes? Have we got tubes? Have we got a bougie? Is suction present and is it functioning correctly? Are we happy with our induction and emergency drugs? And are they correctly labelled? New anaesthetists sometimes forget to draw up a saline flush. This is often a very useful addition to our armoury. Have we decided what our plan B, C and D are going to be? Do we need to use a checklist to ensure all of the equipment we require is present and available? And then the last part of preparation is personnel. Do we have or do we need experienced personnel in theatre? The importance of our operating department practitioner cannot be overstated here. Do the theatre team know what our plan is? And is there any other staff who can give us a hand whilst we perform our rapid sequence induction? And have we been in contact with the senior who ultimately has responsibility for this case? Are we happy that they are accessible if we, go, if we run into difficulty? Moving on, pre-oxygenation. This is a vital step for any general anaesthetic. This involves the application of a high concentration of oxygen for a period of time with the aim to increase the entire oxygen concentration above 85%. Here, we are denitrogenifying the functional residual capacity an essence filling up the patient storage tank with oxygen. The functional residual capacity is the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume and in the normal adult equals about 30 mls per kilogram, so around 2 litres. The average oxygen consumption of the normal adult is about 200 millilitres per minute. Therefore, you can see if we've got 2 litres of oxygen stored in the tank, then in theory we should have around 10 minutes of oxygen during apnea before desaturation. There are factors that may reduce the functional residual capacity and so reduce the oxygen storage capacity. This is commonly seen in the obese patient, those who are pregnant, those with intra-abdominal pathology, as well as any patient who is supine compared to sat up. Another issue to consider is whether the patient is in a hypermetabolic state. This may use up more of the oxygen stored per unit time and therefore reduce the amount of time before desaturation occurs. Septic patients are particularly at risk here. Pre-treatment. Now that we've got good IV access, we want to keep it functioning throughout the rapid sequence induction. Having a run and drip has two benefits. It can increase the intravascular volume and potentially reduce the risk of hypotension on induction and also maintains line patency throughout the process, acting like a flush on drug administration. Pressure and precisioning. Cricoid pressure, or the Selleck manoeuvre, was first described in 1961. It's quite a controversial um, method, actually, and there are some contraindications. So, if the patient has suspected cricotracheal injury, active vomiting, an unstable C spine injury, or they need to be bag mass ventilated, or if there's potentially a difficult view of the cords on laryngoscopy. Generally, the point of cricoid pressure is to prevent 
passive gastric aspiration into the lungs by compression of the esophagus. And this is typically suggested um, pressure of 40 newtons applied by the anesthetic assistant to the cricoid. Some sources, such as the life in the fast lane, conclude that this is an example of an intervention introduced with little evidence, being handed down from teacher to student over the years as a pseudo-axiom. Increasingly, cricoid pressure is being avoided, and this is the case especially for the Northwest Pre-Hospital Emergency Team. Positioning is absolutely vital. We aim to use the sniff in the morning air position in the non-obese patient, and what we're doing is lining up these three axes that you can see in the top picture. We aim for oral, laryngeal and pharyngeal axes to be lined up to allow us a view of the vocal cords during laryngoscopy. In the obese patient, we have a different position and we're aiming for the auditory canal in line with the sternum, as you can see in the picture below. We move on to paralysis with induction. Our aim is to induce anesthesia rapidly. Common induction agents include propofol and thiopental. Common opioids that we might use include fentanyl or alfentanil. The latter has the advantage of a faster onset of action. Rapid neuromuscular blockade is key. Succimethonium is being classically used, but as you can see is associated with an increased incidence of anaphylaxis and has some key contraindications. Hyperkalemia, patients who are 24 hours after significant burns or those greater than 7 days post-crush injury or denervation, all of up-regulation of their acetylcholine receptors and potentially an increased risk of hyperkalemia on induction with succimethonium. It's also contraindicated in those with a history of malignant hyperthermia. Rocuronium is an alternative and this takes slightly longer than sucks to provide optimal neuromuscular blockade but it's the added advantage of having a reversal agent. Sugamandex so makes it possible to swiftly and completely reverse neuromuscular blockade in the event of difficulty. Placement and proof. Once we have intubated the cords, our next step is to prove this to ourselves. We can do this by checking capnography. The fourth national order project found that 70% of deaths related to airway management occurred when capnography was not used. Thus, if there is a normal waveform on at least five ventilatory cycles, one can assume that the trachea is being intubated correctly. We can follow this up with being confident that we have seen the endotracheal tube pass through the vocal cords and also listening for bilateral equal breath sounds. Once we have successfully confirmed placement of the tube and the pilot balloon has been inflated, we can safely remove cricoid pressure. We then need to ensure that we have adequately secured the tube. We need to ensure we are ventilating the patient and make sure there is a method of anesthesia delivery to mitigate against accidental awareness. Once we are happy that the patient is safe to proceed, we should let the theatre team know so that the WHO safety timeout can occur.